So, of course, you've got Jacob and Esau, these two twins. Um, they're relatively competitive, and they belong to two different spheres. Esau is a hunter. He's red, ruddy, whatever that means. Yeah. Whether that's his hair or his skin from being out of doors. Right. Uh, he's, he's just a hairy beast of a guy, apparently. Yeah. Um, and here's the thing. His father, Isaac, got to make sure I got my names right. Yep. Loves wild game. Yeah. Hunted meat. He meets. loves wild game. Not the so domesticated here, out in yeah. the pen. He likes Mm-mm. the stuff out in the woods. I want my, my venison on the hoof out there. Yes. So as the aged man then has kind of one of his last requests of sorts, it's not last word, but he, he he's aged, he, he's blind. He asks his son Esau, who's his favorite, by the way, yeah. to go get him some meat. Son, Go hunt something down. Bring daddy some good venison. Mm -hmm. Now, Esau goes, but he has another son, Jacob, the deceiver of sorts, who hangs out not in the fields, but in the tents, many times in the company of women. Yes. And his mother is trying to manipulate then the, the affection of Isaac for Jacob. And Jacob and his mother work out a plan where venison is acquired. And Jacob puts on, I don't know how this works, basically some fur, which is deceptive, goes into the blind father, offers it to him. His father feels his hairiness, blesses him instead of blessing the older son Esau. Esau comes back and says, what happened? I was gone for a little bit, brought back food, and this is what the deceiver my brother has done. And mom, by the way. Yeah, Um, mom was in on it. The story then has these two brothers, the tent dweller. Yeah, I call him the mama's boy. And, Jacob's the mama's and boy. And the mama's boy, yeah. a kind of an effeminate character. And the ruddy, red, hairy. hairy man of the field and hunter in juxtaposition. Interestingly enough, while God does bless Esau, it's the tent dweller, the raiser of, of, of animals. There's a story, of course, about how he's blessed with, with, his, with his herds it's the nomadic, sometimes suburban or urban type, uh, uh, domesticator of animals, is the one who is the one that God chooses. The pastoralist. Not the pastoralist, good, excellent term. It's not the hunter. Yeah. And this and, is kind of used as an argument. This is the absolutely. definitive moment where God says, hunting is evil, pastoralism is good. Pastoralism is good, yeah. And should we read that story as a condemnation of hunting or is, are those well, I, are, is there an ideology yeah. here or is it just that it so happens that esau is the hunter jacob's the pastoralist and then also i think as as men we ask ourselves well is it also saying that being a mama's boy and like manipulating your dad with your mom is also like the righteous <laughs> like is that what we want to teach our sons you know like hey hang out with mom a lot and trick yeah. me to get stuff that you want mm, yeah i don't know about that either it, it's tricky, I mean, and you, sh- you know, he's also, if I remember correctly, a polygamist, uh, which well, never really works out well in the Hebrew Bible. No. Uh, it, it, it's hard to make Jacob a hero. He's an anti-hero in some ways. Yeah. Yet he's a hero. He's the hero of the faith, the founder. Yeah, I know you've got Abraham, but he's the founder of the, of the children of Israel. Um. So it's hard not to take the story at times as a condemnation of hunting. But then if you say if it's a condemnation of hunting and of a past way of life, is this simply a myth that explains a transition then from the hunting and gathering way of life to the more sedentary, so instead of the, uh, right, the, the, the mobile uh, the hunting and gathering lifestyle, which makes and fends for itself to this sedentary pastoralist, uh, to agriculturalists, Perhaps it is. Maybe it does answer that question it that way. This is this is of course the people who are writing the story. Um, it's it's difficult. Again, how many people name their kids Esau? Yeah, nobody. Yeah, yeah, I know a lot of Jacobs. A lot of Jacobs, no Esaus. Yeah, and you know, it, I, I've been reflecting on this, and I'm thinking to myself, it does seem to be the way of nature, the way of God's providential care, that we move into an agricultural and pastoral society because. You know, the way of the the hunter or the pot hunter, the one who's going right. for food, is right. difficult. I mean, 
and you think about how it's very difficult to sustain, you can look at like the, the Native Americans and the, and the Sioux and these tribes, that when the buffalo disappear, yes. it's apocalyptic right. because that's what they have. And so it's, and right. also like, you know, depending on how much you, how, how many animals can you kill to feed 100,000 people? Right. How much hunting do you have to do to feed 100,000 people? It's not sustainable. So for, for us to have a culture and a society and all of our kids get three meals a day and get you know enough protein and fat and the things that we need for everyone to survive, you have to transition from the yep. wild game to the pastoralist, cultivated, domesticated food sources for the prosperity of all. And we yet, have the meal. And yet there is the fringe of us like you and me yeah who still have that itch in them to go out and get the food that Isaac wants. Right. And is that it's bad? In, it's intriguing. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, so there's a couple of questions that historically we know that we see population explosions take place. Mm -hmm. The Neolithic agricultural revolution is not only accompanied by the rise of towns and villages, but huge population. Yes. Uh, and then when you see that type of transitions or, or new innovations in agriculture, we see then huge population booms. So we support them by way of population, uh, pardon me, by way of agriculture. If we lived in a hunting and gathering society, population would be very small. No. So it's when we shift and we move then that we have those things. So there is the question of what must we do to continue the population? Uh, and it radically changes the culture and the expectations of relationships um, as people populate the earth and live in increasingly urban environments. Uh, and you can see that it literally changing mores in America over the last 200 years yes. as we move from a mostly rural to now a dramatically more urban environment. And populations are there. They make the votes. They make the choices for decision making when it comes to policy, when it comes to laws, et cetera. Yeah. So we're, we're experiencing that ourselves. And so the question then is, there's multiple questions. For the Christian, is hunting a wrong action? Is it something that makes me worse? In other words, first off, is it somehow, is there the God say no to it? Or is it something that is not part of the perfection of my person? as deemed by God, that God has provided plans then and works to us through grace, but for the perfection of our person, which probably will never be in this time period, right, in this life, but that we are working forward and hopefully being transformed by grace, is there a place for hunting to disappear? Or just, we shouldn't participate at all. Right. Is it a misuse of God's creation? Yeah. And if it's a misuse of God's creation, it opens all kinds of other doors. Then also, should you be killing animals at all? So should you be killing animals in an impersonal way where you basically have your own assassins that then provide for you right. meat for your stomach? You yes. don't even there for the death. Yeah. You don't um, even want to know about it. You just want the styrofoam container, the meat, the, the wrap over it, right? right. With the sticker with the name on it, price per pound. That's all you want. And so then some people don't even do that. Yeah. They just eat out. You know, yeah, it literally exactly. comes as a ham pre-prepared -pre hamburger or a chicken yeah. nugget in a box. The only blood they want to see is in their rare steak. Yes, right. And they really don't want to think what the red is, if that makes sense. Exactly. They joke about mooing, but they would right. never think about being there for that moment. When the moo turns to a, exactly. yeah, to a, uh, well, I won't even say, but you know what it sounds like. Oh, yeah. I, I, for the, I butchered my first cow in the yeah. last year. Mm -hmm. Uh put it down and someone the, the farmer put it down and it was my responsibility to butcher the whole sucker yeah how long did it take you how long did it take you i did it at night i think it took me around three to four hours by yourself uh, uh yeah well the guys are standing around watching me with the headlights on <laughs> and I, and the guy for whom i was cutting it up who has a number of children mm -hmm. uh, uh i was cutting up he would help me and sharpen blades and hand yeah. them to me Yep. Uh, it took me a good, I'm going to say four hours in, in the Texas field. Yep. It was hot and, uh, no, and it was, I've, it I've was done, vicious. I've never actually done a cow, but I've done big, big animals and it's, yeah. yeah, it takes, I've done it with other guys did, like two hours, you know? Oh yeah. I did my first elk this year. Mm -hmm. I couldn't move it. I needed everybody to help me. Yeah. Um, 
to move it and to, to do it. All that is to say is that there are there, once you start thinking about it, the questions just pour. Yeah. One of my goals then, in the whole process, I, I mean, I joke about Dr. Bebbington and the French thing, is to encourage Christians just to think. I'm not sure what the answer is going to be for each one of them. But if they take seriously this idea of should I or should I not? What's my role? Who am I in relationship to God? Who am I in relationship to nature? Uh, what does scripture inform me? What does my tradition inform me? Um, if they're doing that, the constant, I want to say like a Hegelian process of throwing ideas out and encountering, you know, different ideas back in trance, there will be a transformation and a responsibility for who they are as a person as a child of God in God's world. It's not ours, it's God's. Yeah. And if they come to the conclusion that hunting is wrong for them, I wholly support that. If they can articulate the reasons why. And I would support them in some ways, I'll say this, this is kind of, this will throw, if you will, gas on the fire. I'll support them more than I will support the hunter who never thinks, who just shoots willy-nilly, who kills animals and leaves them because someone said it was okay, who has not worked through that process of responsibility. Yeah. If you have a child, do you not think about what it means to be a parent, having bring a soul into the world? Right. Have you thought about taking a life out of the world? Yeah. Whether it's a cow on your plate or the animal that you actually just brought about their death. Yeah. We're responsible. Yeah. I've, I've had that struggle my entire life. My, my dad hunted. My relatives hunt. I hunted as a boy. I've been to Africa to hunt um, all over North America, small game, big game. And there's always been, like you said, there's that tragedy in, in it, but also something metaphysical about it, Absolutely. something trans transformative. I remember being with my oldest son and getting his first deer and both of us kind of being a little teary, you know, like kind of a weird, like emotional, like primal thing happens, you know, like, Absolutely. And just seeing him and like, are you okay? You know, like, do you want to pray? You know, like it's, it's a big deal, you know? And I think so, I talk with my brother about this and we still, after all these years, you get that. I don't know what the feeling is, but when the hunt goes well and you you're there with that animal and it's just died and it's, there's some, there's this feeling that I can't explain, but even when I retell hunting stories, it comes back to me and I, I think it just must be like this ancient primal feeling of taking a life and then that you've killed and now you know I'm going to live. Mm -hmm. This animal but is I'd sacrificed for animal. me. Yeah. yeah, and then Absolutely. and then one day I'm going to be food for worms and, and bacteria. So it's just this, you know, very few of us, unless you're in a war, have a direct encounter with dead human bodies. Right. Pretty rare, unless you're a policeman or something. But to be in the in the in the presence of the dead human body and then to, to prepare it and then to eat it is, um, there's, there's something, I don't want to say supernatural because it's too strong, but there's something preternatural to it. And, uh, you know, I think as a Christian, I, I could agree with someone who says I can't hunt. I, I, I find it repulsive or I find it unethical, but I think when it came, when it comes to like extreme animal rights activism, like, you know, PETA or something like that, as Christians, I mean, we have Acts 10, where there's a vision where Peter sees right. all these animals, clean and unclean, kosher and unkosher. Right. God says to kill them and eat them. Right. There's a command. I mean, we can debate on Genesis 6 and pre-flood and all that, but it's very clear a commandment in Acts 10, take, kill, eat, right. slaughter, eat.